That's loud. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Brooklyn's Auditorium for this program that's uh, with the World Affairs Council, co-sponsored with the Midwest Association of Latin American Studies. We're, we're delighted that we could, could, could uh, cooperate with one another to have the advantage and opportunity to hear from Ambassador Maito and uh, Mato, and um, also uh, I'll put out a little word. No, a lot of you maybe are going to the conference that's going to take place over the weekend here. It's here at the university, I assume, and uh, I know that some people are going to be participating in that, and we, we are delighted that we can have the first experience with Ambassador Mato. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, for the students that are here, and now I can't pick them out, but I know they're here because they had dinner with us. Uh, we're delighted that you're also here for this speaker series tonight. Before we, before I call upon um, uh, Adriana Crocker to introduce the speaker, I, I wanted to just to have one announcement for the World Affairs Council, and I'm asking the, our Vice President for program, uh, Bruce Strom, to come up and tell you about our November program. Well, welcome to everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, our program uh, in uh, November, I think, will be interesting uh, and informative. Um, our speaker will be Darren Byler, who is a professor at Washington University in the anthropology department. His areas of interest are Islamic studies, migration, politics and representation, race and ethnicity, socialism, uh, and post-socialism, and uh, war and terror, China, and in particular, <laughs> what happened here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, in particular, he focuses on uh, and this word is spelled very differently than it's pronounced, but Iga, Iga China, which is an area or region in China, and it also represents an ethnic group in China. Um, this, uh, this ethnic group is a minority Turkic ethnic group, and it's in the central and west area uh, of it, uh, central and east area of Asia. Uh, and it's one of 55 recognized minorities in China. Um, they are primarily a Muslim community. I'd like to uh, just make just a couple of more comments here about the program to give you a sense of what he will be talking about. The speaker will explain how a new Chinese system of control which is made up of a multi-billion dollar industry of computer vision technologies, militarized policing, and the mass mobilization of Chinese civil servants and Han industrialists. And it's being used, this new system, in an attempt to transform Iga and other Turkic minority societies in Northwest China. This program uh, will talk about how re-education is, in fact, a socializing engineering system that works in concert with a Chinese form of illiberal capitalism. It has the effect of partitioning and radically disempowering those already marginalized within national and international global systems. It shows that these new automated forms of surveillance, coercive oncentric education systems, as well as new modes of state-enforced capital discipline, amplify the power of those who engineer and implement these systems while rapidly disintegrating minority social systems. So that gives you a sense of what we may hear about from uh, Professor Byler's presentation next month. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, 
At this time, uh, as president of the World Affairs Council, I am pleased to call upon Professor uh, Adriana Crocker, who has been very much involved not only with the conference planning for the weekend, but has uh, being, on, being on our program committee has helped make this evening possible tonight. So Adriana, if you'll come and introduce the speaker of the introduce you to Ambassador John Maestro. First of all, bienvenidos, todos. <laughs> and uh, John Maestro is a 37-year former career member of the U.S. Foreign Service. He was ambassador to Venezuela in the really turbulent years of 1997 to the year 2000, Nicaragua 1993 to 1996, and the Organization of American States from 2003 to 2006. He was senior director of the Western Hemisphere at the National Security Council and concurrently special assistant to the president in the years 2001 to 2003. He was foreign policy advisor at the U.S. Southern Command, deputy assistant secretary of state for Central America, and he served in Argentina, Bolivia, Costa Rica, Panama, and the Philippines. His Philippine service was in Manila and as political officer from 1978 to 1982 and at the State Department as Deputy Director and then Director of Philippine Affairs during the People Power Transition to Democracy. In Panama, he was Deputy Chief of Mission and the Shah Sheikh Affair from 1986 to 1999 throughout the Noriega authoritarian period and the Panamanian Civil Society resistance. In his Central America and OAS Organization of American States positions in the early 1990s, he dealt with the end of hostilities, elections, democratic transitions in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. Ambassador Meister's presentation today uh, will um, discuss the United States and Latin America, challenges and opportunities, and will explore current U.S. foreign policy in Latin America, placing special emphasis on U.S.-Venezuelan relations and U.S. diplomatic relations with several Central American countries. Ambassador Maestro will also serve as keynote speaker for the Midwest Association for Latin American Studies Conference, which will uh, open tomorrow, and it'll be, uh, we have two days of that. I have um, several programs, if you want to look at uh, the programs and what we're going to be doing in the next two days at this conference, and it's going to take place here, at this PAC building, rooms H and G. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Louis Bittencourt, so please stand up. Dr. Dr. Bittencourt is originally from Brazil and is Professor of International Security at the Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, National Defense University, and visiting professor at Georgetown University. He is originally from Brazil and is a plenary speaker for MALAS. Tomorrow, uh, he's going to be at the PAC building, room H, from between 4.45 and 5.45 p.m., and he will be discussing Bolsonaro's Brazil, democracy, and the Amazon. So on-site registration is available tomorrow in front of the PACH or G uh, rooms, and we hope you can make it as well. We have wonderful presentations then. But we, cannot, uh, we are looking forward to this wonderful presentation by Ambassador Meister. Adriana, thank you very much, and thank all of you for the opportunity to be here, both uh, to the Foreign Affairs Council, Springfield, um, and to Malas for the opportunity to be uh, not only uh, uh, here with these remarks, but to participate in the conference. Uh, it's going to be especially interesting uh, to be uh, with Dr. Betancourt to hear all about uh, Brazil, which uh, intrigues anybody who knows anything about Latin America. Uh, I will have a few words of my own to say, but uh, if you can get to his presentation, you should. <laughs> uh, 
um, kind of the subtitle that I selected was um, Latin American Democracy and U.S. Policy. And um, let me just plunge into it. The question of Latin American democracy is nicely laid out in a very good book by Millet, Holmes, and Perez, book of the same title, uh, but with the subtitle, Emerging Reality or Endangered Species. Here is a copy of the book. It's written by my friend, Dr. Dick Millet, no, edited, put together by Dr. Millet. He's written chapters, etc. Uh, and it lays out the ideas that are going to be taken up in this conference. And uh, that is particularly exciting. Just the other day, I was asked to give a lecture at George Washington University to, uh, uh, to an undergraduate class. I was happy to accept it. And I said, by the way, what textbook are you using? And they said, oh, we're using the Millet textbook. Um, so uh, I was glad to hear that because uh, uh, it, it is good. Now, the subtitle, Emerging Reality or Endangered Species. My vote in the context of the what the authors say, it depends, sounds very Washingtonian, by the way, uh, would be, my response would be, still emerging reality. Although, see, I don't get into the endangered species piece of it. Because I would say that although the democratic systems of all the countries of the region have received blows over the past decades, in my view, Latin American democracy, with warts large and small, slings and arrows, is here to stay. This thinking begins with the end of the Cold War, after which time democracy broke out in the hemisphere. Look at the number of military-controlled authoritarian governments from World War II to the 1980s. I remember them well, and Dr. Millet does too. All the Central Americans, except Costa Rica and Belize, all the South Americans, except Colombia and Venezuela, and Mexico, uh, Mexico with its one-party system, though not military, but with the fall of the, not military, but with the fall of the wall, the end of the Central American conflicts in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, the resolution of most of the territorial conflicts of South America, such as Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, Chile, but not, I admit, Venezuela, Guyana, uh, a big re remaining one, all ushered in a new political reality based on a new belief in workable democratic systems. The political clout for this was provided by the policies of the winner of the Cold War and in the overall loss of faith in the Soviet and Cuban systems and their ideological struggle against Yankee imperialism of old. The process involved in Washington, new bipartisan approaches that produced the North America, the North America Free Trade Agreement, launched in the Bush administration and completed in the Clinton years, and then in the impossibility of a hemispheric free trade agreement, which was killed by the Mercosur countries, led by Brazil and Argentina, came a host of bilateral trade agreements, the latter the work of the Bush and Obama administrations, having to do with Chile, CAF the Dominican Republic, Peru, Colombia, Panama. These changes helped launch, with careful U.S. diplomacy, a newly empowered organization of American states on human rights through the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, a new focus on democracy as manifested in the 2001 Inter-American Democratic Charter, new OAS energy and election observation helped by the United States, and horizontal co cooperation among hemispheric experts in a variety of areas, cooper cooperation against terrorism and narcotics trafficking and international criminal organizations and the move to support judicial reform in a variety of areas and uh, support human rights. And uh, I'm happy going off script. There's a, a visitor here in the audience, Faye Armstrong, who worked in the State Department for years and years, a real champion uh, with whom I had the pleasure of working. Then there was Luis Betancourt, who was working over on the military side of things. All of these strong professional uh, participation in moving that agenda through. Um, 
In country after country, the military came under the political control of the elected president because of regularly observed elections determined the selection of leaders. That kind of took care of the old military dictatorship uh, threats and realities of Latin America from Bolivar to the end of the 20th century. That's a challenging statement and I expect to have some pushback on it uh, and we'll have some fun with it. Of course, the huge economic and social issues, re issues remain. And although economies grew, distribution of growth benefits improved, and middle classes grew, it's not enough, not nearly enough. The result, now into the fifth of the new century, Latin America is a mixed picture with regard to its political, economic, and social realities. But I think we can agree that these days, the challenge is that governments elected democratically are expected to govern democratically and to fight against corruption. The reason that most of the new governments over the past several years uh, have been elected. Accountability and fighting corruption are big deals in today's Latin America. I would submit that there are three categories of elected democracies in Latin America, elected governments that are democracies in Latin America. Allow me to provide an overall look which you may or may not agree with, but let me throw it out. This is based on how the countries are faring democratically in the still emerging categories. Number one, the ones that are doing reasonably well, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Panama, Uruguay, Paraguay, Costa Rica, Guyana. A second category with problems, big to medium sized, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Bolivia, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Suriname. And country, and thirdly, not democratic. Unfortunately, my dear Venezuela is one of them. Cuba, the old, the system remains, the authoritarian system in place. With regard to Venezuela, until Maduro's so-called election last year, I and others called Venezuela a, quote, hybrid authoritarian populist, not really democratic system. <laughs> but there was an electoral system that produced the opposition-controlled National Assembly, but not a legitimately elected president, and I will get into that. That's what has undone Maduro, and that's what the big issue in Venezuela is all about politically. And of course, in a class by itself, is Cuba. Now what about the socialist communist on the one hand versus the democratic capitalist ideological divisions? Well, today, that sort of thinking isn't really valid. Today, several duly elected democratic governments that did reasonably well were headed by leaders of socialist or labor or revolutionary or popular political parties. And as we have seen, several left, left of center governments were succeeded by right of center, uh, center governments or by other left of center governments. There's a pendulum, not completely ununderstandable to those of us who live in the United States. <laughs> what counts nowadays, simply, is having been elected democratically governing democratically, period. And on the economic side, delivering the goods, and this is tougher, and regular, free, fair elections. I remember the election of Lula, president of Brazil, in 2002. I was in Washington. People were going crazy. Oh, there goes the hemisphere. Lula, the socialist, the communist, the labor guy, along with Cuba, and oh, and oh, this is terrible. Well, President Lula and President Bush, no ideological slouch himself, got along face. A conservative American president and a Brazilian Labor Party type. They met, they talked, they consulted, and they got along just fine. Why? Because Brazil produced its new leader, Democratic. A hemispheric 
overview now that I'm going to go through fast. It's a mixed bag. There's a positive picture in several key areas. The gr growth in Latin America in the last decade, particularly when the region benefited from high raw material prices, was, uh, was pretty good in the 5% range. Not so now. Over the last three, four, five years, it's gone down. The projections for growth in Latin America are about 3% in 2019. Um, excuse me, 1.7% in 2019. Um, uh, and kind of inching, but now inching up again. Today's realities, and these are important to keep in mind, extreme poverty exists, uh, but has decreased in the last 20 years. It's now around 10% of the overall population. Extreme poverty is less than $2.50 a day or less. The middle class has grown dramatically from one-fifth to one-third in the past decade. Now, more in the middle class, that's a 10 to $15 a day range, than at, uh, than at the poverty level, $4 or less. But 35% of the poor live in female-headed households. And the vulnerable levels, like lower middle class to poor or poor to poorer, have increased slightly over the past several years. The corruption issue is huge. 30% of the population in Latin America per polling says that they have to pay some type for some type of public service, a bribe a tip, a commission, or whatever. I think the, that percentage is a little low myself, but that's what the polling says. Now, the region got through the financial crisis of 2008 because many countries did financial and structural reforms at that time. And many benefited at the same time from free trade agreements with the United States and, and with other countries. I think Chile has free trade agreements with about 50 countries, and Mexico is really increasing its. And as I said, the middle classes have grown in the past 15 years. Poverty overall fell. And, uh, but, and, but why did it fall? Some of the reasons were cash transfer programs, improved education, lower population growth, uh, but that hasn't had that much effect over the past three years. I could go on with lots of statistics. I don't do that. But I would like to say that the best performers in the hemisphere are, in terms of economic terms, along with their democratic systems, would be Panama, Colombia, Chile, Bolivia, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay. Brazil is a special case. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin will talk about Brazil. Uh, but uh, the growth rate in Brazil for 2019 is projected to be 1.13 percent. Back in 2015, it was minus 3.5 percent. And then it's gradually started coming back. Uh, but uh, the important thing to remember is that there is realization in Latin America about what they need to do to improve their economies. They need to improve productivity. They need structural reform. They must fight corruption and introduce transparency. And they need improved education and health. All of these are big issues in Latin America today. I would argue that uh, the, uh, the country that has the edge, because uh, all of these things are kind of tied to the United States economy, is Mexico as a result of the free trade agreement. Uh, now called the United States-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement by our new president, but it's, it's, it's the old NAFTA, except for about 20%, which would have been taken care of no matter who was elected president of the United States or president of Mexico or, or, uh, or prime minister of Canada. Um, the overriding driving interest in the hemisphere seems to be two issues, corruption and making the economies produce better. If you want an example of that, take a look at the Brazilian election, uh, and, uh, and uh, it boils down to uh, people in Brazil after 
corruption after corruption scandal, demanding a completely new leader, and they got one out of the away from the traditional political parties in in in, in Brazil, and uh, that uh, that is a fascinating situation to watch. I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. Overall, from a macro point of view, uh, there are three factors that I want to call to the attention uh, of anybody thinking about uh, Latin America and uh, the relationship of the United States with Latin America. The first is called what I consider the United States factor. <coughs> the United States is the country most tied to Latin America and the Caribbean. It's tied in every way, trade, investment, education, cultural ties, movement of people, family ties. And United States power really means something in the Western Hemisphere. 52% of U.S. exports go to the hemisphere. Of all our exports, 50% go to the Western Hemisphere. This trade, this economic activity supports close to 5 million U.S. jobs. U.S. trade with China last year was $636 billion. With Canada, it was $582. With Mexico, $557. Do the math, throw in the other countries that you will see how important the trade that those numbers are. And U.S. policy traditionally supports this geographic, geopolitical, and economic reality. First, it's bipartisan. The idea of strengthening partnerships, growth, democracy, security, to avoid getting sucked into old debates, looking at the hemisphere as a hemisphere of opportunity, those are all the commanding themes in the bilateral relationship. But what about the Trump administration, people will ask? Uh, what, what are the Trump administration's attitudes about Latin America? Well, on the rhetorical side, they're pretty much a continuation of what has happened in all the previous administrations. Values, freedom, democracy, prosperity, security, moving beyond common interests to shared values. The Western Hemisphere, a committed partner for the United States, and, and a new strategy to destroy criminal cartels in the region. All sorts of the things you would like to hear from the President of the United States, but I would submit this. Style is as important as substance in foreign affairs, and words really do matter. Unfortunately, the perceptions of the United States in Latin America are negative. 77% of the population in Latin America have no confidence in the United States to do the right thing in world affairs. In Mexico, that number is 93% who have no confidence in us. That's what we're living with. There is a new Pacific factor, the Pacific Alliance, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, all looking to East Asia and the Pacific as a new area of expansion and growing bilaterally. All of this would have fit nicely into something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership and was moving in that direction, uh, but um, it was interrupted by the current president who did not think the Trans-Pacific Partnership idea was a good idea. And uh, I would just say parenthetically that the one country that really applauded that decision was the People's Republic of China because the Trans-Pacific Partnership would have really um, provided some uh, uh, really uh, important competition to them. Uh, there is something called the ongoing China factor in Latin America. There is an expanding interest of China, but it's mostly economic, uh, raw materials for its growing population, and they accompany that by increased lending, uh, usually to the least creditworthy countries. Uh, the China Development Bank assistance flows to the Western Hemisphere, and get this stat, are more than the flows of the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Latin American Development Bank combined. Now that is a really important figure. Uh, 
um, but they are kind of focusing it on, on focusing it on on several countries, not a lot of them, and they are still looking at raw materials. Um, Venezuela oil, Argentina soy, Brazil iron ore, Ecuador energy oil. Um, but more recently, the Chinese have been moving into more services to sell. The one belt, one road approach. Something you should get a you, you should get a speaker on that one because that is really something to watch. Um, they're expanding equity investment, uh, also in modest but significant military activities, including arms sales, training, education, and institutional exchanges. There's technological engagement, satellites, launching satellites from Brazil, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, and deep space radar installation in Argentina, and Chinese space observations in Chile. Uh, all of that is going on. All of that is a challenge for the United States. But let's not remember one other thing that drives the Chinese, and that is to displace Panama. Excuse me, to displace Taiwan. And they did that successfully over the past 18 months or so. Bilateral relations of Taiwan with Panama and the Dominican Republic and El Salvador were shifted over to the People's Republic of China. This is a huge interest of uh, the, the People's Republic. And slowly but surely, uh, they're getting it. By the way, a country that continues to have bilateral relations with Taiwan and is keeping China at arm's length is Nicaragua, Significant, significantly enough. Uh, again, I return to the theme that Mexico, because of the realities, uh, is uh, so tied up with the United States that um, it is, uh, uh, the, the economic realities are, are continuing forward. Uh, and uh, the, the numbers just say it all. Um, w one, of the, one of the most impressive numbers uh, has to do with, uh, when I said the number of jobs, um, and the fact that uh, United States-Mexican trade flow, if you can imagine this, is more than one million, uh, more than one, uh, 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 one billion dollars per minute. One point, no, no, one million dollars per minute. One point four billion dollars a day, every day. One point four billion dollars. Over 500 billion, close to 600 billion a year. And uh, then the question comes, well, if that's the situation, where have all those U.S. jobs gone? The answer is two words. China and robots. Yeah. That's where they've gone. Um, right. Now, in the meantime, the Mexicans are working on their issues, fighting corruption, more education, um, investment in human capital, more infrastructure investment, more rule of law reform, sustainable development. Uh, and now they have to deal with President Trump. And the Mexicans, if you watch it closely, are not getting suckered into playing nationalist games. Uh, what the Mexicans are doing is concentrating on the basics. And that is their number one objective was to make sure that NAFTA did not disappear. And they even did that. Uh, they did that and at the same time elected Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, a Mexican nationalist, a strict one, who uh, and under his direction, Mexico has been the mature partner in dealing with the United States. Wow. They've done masterful work in taking care of their interests. And uh, they're, they're going to continue doing that. They just will just not pay attention to the rhetoric. Although in the Mexican public, it really makes an impression. Central America, the Northern Triangle. You know, several years ago, the thinking in Washington was 
with regard to Latin America and particularly Central America. No nukes, no terrorists, no problem. Well, no more. And the reason that change is the flow of people north from Central America through Mexico and including Mexicans. Why? People were moving away from poverty, from violence, from drug gangs. And why? Was all of these things important in those countries, which, and those countries are not the producing states, they're mainly the transit states, the producing states are still in the Andes, has to do with the huge consumption of, of uh, those uh, substances in the United States. Two thirds of Central Americans have been affected by violence themselves, family and friends, that's per polling. Two out of three Central Americans have personally felt it in some fashion. Uh, violence is the number one issue. Homicide rates uh, are among the highest in the world. Why are there gangs? Because of the flow of drugs north, the, uh, the money that flows south, the arms that flow south, the money uh, that uh, buys uh, local politicians, the corruption, uh, it is, uh, it's still going on. Then what have US policies been in Central America? Well, during both the uh, Clinton and the, and the Obama administration, something called the Alliance for Prosperity to engage at local levels, strengthening institutions, dealing with youth and poverty and opportunity. Um, a lot of money in the 500 to 800 million dollar range but most recently, and I find this hard to understand, the assistance funding has been cut off in the Northern Triangle. And what is being lost? In other words, the message out of Washington is, people are flowing north, you people aren't doing anything to stop it, we've been giving you aid, by golly, we're gonna stop giving aid. So what has been stopped? Huh? Aid mainly to nonprofit organizations and civil society. In Honduras, working with local communities, um, the homicide rates were beginning to drop in Honduras. Something called Feed the Future, investments in agriculture, leveraging local money with um, foreign assistance money. The, uh, the Millennium Challenge uh, uh, system, aiding small farmers, That's, those are grants to countries that are doing their best to improve themselves in improving their institutions, fighting corruption, etc. Small farmers, transportation, infrastructure. In El Salvador, helping small businesses create jobs. Uh, they, have a they have a national security plan focusing on communities that, are, that have the most violence. I personally was there when it got launched and have been following it since it was working. Well, they're running out of money. Um, uh, monies in uh, El Salvador for education, agriculture, rural business development, infrastructure, housing, electricity, competitiveness. Um, in Guatemala, more money to hire judges because if judges aren't paid enough, they're gonna get robbed. <laughs> yeah. And they're gonna knuckle under to, to drug gangs and so That's a huge, huge problem uh, because the cartels are very strong. In all three countries, increasing funds. All of that assistance money has been halted as we wait for the flow to stop. Not sure that that's going to happen. Uh, I categorize some countries. I think the cool countries are the Pacific Coast countries from Chile up north, uh, uh, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Panama. Colombia has now entered another chapter in its history uh, because of the outpouring of migrants from Venezuela, number one, and, uh, and a return of the production of coca, number two. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, uh, there was a by, there has been and still exists a bipartisan approach to Colombia I'm happy to say that this administration is continuing it. Uh, something called Plan Colombia that began 
at the end of the Clinton administration, went through Bush, went through Obama, and is still being dealt with, um, and, and with uh, still being used by this administration. Um, there's a long history. Colombia was almost a failed state in the year 2000. Then they got some good leadership that decided that they themselves were going to contribute a lot of money to it, and we joined in to help them. And it's been regular bipartisan support. As a result, Colombia is a thriving country, but Colombia is a country that is all facing a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure due to the two issues I just named, the migrants from Venezuela and, uh, and the increased coca production. Um, I want to jump briefly to Brazil. And I'm going to say briefly because Dr. Bettencourt is going to handle it. Uh, you know, the first thing you have to remember about Brazil is its size. Brazil has a population of 210 million people. It's the fifth largest in the world. Has the seventh largest GDP in the world. Most Fortune 5 countries are in Brazil. And the U.S. is a leading foreign investor in Brazil. And there's a thriving relationship with the United States and Americans at all levels, levels you don't even see. Um, this continues, and it's good. And this administration is fostering that. Uh, nevertheless, at the same time, <laughs> the political system produced a lot of issues. And the reason that Mr. Bolsonaro was elected uh, is number one, corruption, and number two, the economy. And a vote for Bolsonaro was a vote against the Labor Party in Brazil, Mr. Lula's old party, and Ms. Dilma Rousseff's old party, and against the corrupt people, something called the car wash scandal that, that, that washed millions, billions of dollars worth of corruption money. Uh, I don't want to plunge into it. It's a fascinating story, but uh, uh, the result is a right of center government, if not an absolute rightist government. It comes out of a military tradition. Just what the military in Brazil is responding to that is something we will hear about. <laughs> um, this, is, this is teasers for, <laughs> for that. Uh, 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 then there's the regulatory drag in the Brazilian economy of the labor regime, tax structure, how to start a business, how to close a business. Uh, watch Brazil carefully. There's some things going on internally in addition to the Amazon issues that are pitting Brazil against the Europeans and the rest of the world. Uh, there's a, some authors say the politics of anger are at work in Brazil, involving the younger generation coming up. Um, and Bolsonaro has grabbed onto them corruption, security, weak economy. Uh, now, what is watch closely. The upcoming new pension law which is really needed as pensions take up to 50, uh, take up so much of the GDP. Raising, you're thinking about raising the retirement age and increasing worker pension contributions. And then after they get that resolved, if it's going to get resolved, I don't know what the latest out of the Brazilian Congress is, there is tax reform. We'll see. But so far, they're pretty solid. Uh, Uruguay is a very cool country. Socialist government, but very democratic. Good relations with the United States, no matter who's president. Then we turn to my dear Argentina, and the phrase I have that goes with it, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> uh, we're going to have an election very soon. The Peronists will probably come back. Uh, a centrist or slightly right of center government of President Macri, who tried to reform all sorts of things, kind of got out in front of himself, inflation went up, cost of living went up, people got angry, <laughs> and there is a, a new Peronist possibility in Argentina. And anybody who knows Argentina says, no, 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 they're saying that the new Peronists who are elected will not be like the old Peronists. <laughs> well, we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. Mr. Fernandez is telling everybody that Mrs. Fernandez, the Vice President, Mrs. Fernandez de Kirchner, 
is not going to be able to control. I see a shaking head in the front row of someone who really knows. All I can say is we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> um, Central America. Uh, Panama's thriving, by the way. Sometimes Panama is included in Central America, sometimes it's not. It depends on the Panamanians, how they're feeling from one day to the next. Um, but um, Panama, since 1989, when the United States, for our own reasons, decided to invade and prevent a regime from, to prevent a narco dictatorship from taking over. Uh, why did we do that? We did that because there was a canal that was still our we had bases that were still there. And at that time, we couldn't countenance anything like that. And Noriega was a real threat. So we took him out militarily. It was quick, cost something. We lost 24 lives. There are 300 to 400 Panamanians who got caught up in this. But Panama has been a success ever since. Success in relative terms. I mean, its growth has been constantly positive. They have regular elections. Uh, it's a combination of between right of center and left of center governments that are elected. The latest government is slightly left of center. The old uh, uh, revolutionary party, which is not revolutionary <laughs> at all. Um, and um, we'll, 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 we'll see how, the, how they do. But it's a great retirement community as a dollar economy. Uh, the Panamanians still want to make Panama City the Singapore of the Western Hemisphere, and they could still do it. Nicaragua. I was positive about Nicaragua until April of last year. It was moving in the right direction, 3 to 4% growth. Yes, Ortega was in charge, but Nicaragua, like Venezuela, has right now uh, the elected government of Daniel Ortega, in power, authoritarian to be sure. Why? Because the opposition in Nicaragua is divided. When they unite and go to an election, they win, as they did in 1990, 1996, 2002. But later on, in the 2000, no, there was an election in 2006, they decided to divide. And when you divide, <laughs> The non-Sandinista population, you lose. You know, it's the Ross Perot factor. <laughs> Chop it off and <laughs> you get presidents elected with 40% of the vote. Ortega was elected with 38% uh, of the vote. But the Nicaraguan constitution says, you won't go to a runoff election if you have more than 35% of the vote, and the difference between the number one and the number two is more than 5%. And guess what? The two opposition groups <laughs> divided the rest of it evenly at 29 to 30%. So Daniel wins in the first round. Talk about dumb. That's dumb. They brought it on themselves. And in Nicaragua, politics get very nasty, very personal, very historic. People have long memories. Reminds me a little bit of the Balkans, <laughs> long memories of what happened three generations ago or four. Uh, and there was a student strike. Um, the regime, the Ortega government responded much in a terrible way. People got killed. They didn't have to do that. They went into a negotiation period. Uh, it didn't work. The opposition wanted uh, Ortega to out, absolutely out, leave, and of course he would. His position is, hey, you want to beat me? We're going to have an election in 2021. Get yourself organized. Well, the interesting thing is the opposition has moved from pounding the table to try to drive the Ortega regime out, which, by the way, always includes coming to Washington and trying to play Washington politics. You know, the people who are against the communists go to that part of the political spectrum in the United States that they think will help them, and the people who are more inclined to a <clears throat> revolutionary solution go to another side of the political spectrum. 
The problem with Daniel Ortega and his wife Rosario right now uh, is that they have no friends in Washington. And they're just beginning to realize that. The opposition is realizing, and this is interesting, a group came to Washington just last week and started talking to people in Washington about how they're going to organize for the next election. In the meantime, <laughs> we have the current administration that throws into the same category the uh, John Bolton called them the, the three stooges of communism, uh, Raul Castro, Maduro, and Daniel Ortega. No, ladies and gentlemen, three different countries require three different approaches and the smart use of U.S. power and diplomacy. And the notion that we're going to drive Ortega out with sanctions ain't going to work. What could work is putting pressure on both sides to sit down and hammer something out like the basic rules for the next election, a new electoral council, a better Supreme Court, and international observation of the next elections. And let's not try to destroy the Nicaraguan economy with sanctions. Remember Vietnam uh, killing, uh, what was it, destroying the town in order to save it? Yes, yes. We don't need to do that. I could not resist that comment here. <laughs> All right, I'm, uh, I have saved the worst to last. <laughs> Venezuela. Things change every day in Venezuela. Anything can happen, anytime. We have a mess in the streets, an economic mess in the, in the streets that goes up and down. We have deep depression, hyperinflation, the latest numbers I've seen are 2,500% for the year. Their GDP <coughs> contracted 22.4% year to year as of September political mess, worsening human rights. According to polling, uh, two-thirds to four-fifths of Venezuelans say that the government is either bad, bad or very bad. But remember one thing, 19% or so, 20% are strongly Chavista. Why? Because the Chavis and the Maduro governments have paid attention to them. They've given them food, they've given them subsidies, they've given them everything that they want. And these are people who have felt left out in the previous time of Venezuelan politics. When Chavez was elected in 1998, he was elected saying essentially two things. Number one, Venezuela is one of the richest countries in the world. Everybody says so because of the oil. If Venezuela is one of the richest countries in the world, why are you poor? What percentage of the population is poor? Chavez used to say 60 to 70 percent. No. Around 30 percent. Yeah. Translate that into people who they got out to vote and people in the middle class who wanted change. I knew Venezuelans from the private sector who said no to the right of center party, no to the left of center party, they're both corrupt. Anybody is better than those two political parties. So they got Chavez. He was charismatic. <laughs> and he said, the other part of it was, you know, if you're not being paid attention to, there must be a lot of corruption going on. <laughs> there was some corruption going on, but Chavez got elected. Um, what we have is uh, this type of, it's not even, it's not socialism. <laughs> it's a, an authoritarian regime in power that controls to their own benefit. But they do pay attention to a certain percentage of the population. The biggest problems are lack of products, or lack of productivity and security. Um, people, you know, 70 to 80% of the Venezuelans, the kind of, tracks with the number of Chavistas don't believe in what the government says. They don't they have no belief in the Electoral Commission 
controlled by Chavez, of the Chavez people. Uh, but the big change, and yet we must understand this, the May 2018 presidential election that Maduro put together said, okay, we're gonna have an election and I'm gonna run for re-election. That's a violation of the Venezuelan constitution, Chavez's constitution, okay? Uh, the opposition said, no, they boycotted. Maduro went ahead with it, got himself elected, tried to get inaugurated in January 2019. However, the president of the National Assembly, because they had a National Assembly election in 2015, and the opposition united behind one candidate per election district. They forgot about all their divisions. The opposition has 20 different political parties, everybody from the extreme right to the communists, the old communist party. They united behind one party. And they won in 2015, okay? And it came time for a representative of one of the parties because they took turns being president and this young fellow by the name of Juan Guaido, 34, 35 years old, became the president. And he said, well, we have a constitution and we have laws. This is a violation of the constitution. This guy's a usurper. The constitution says, uh, if you don't have a government in place, then the president of the National Assembly becomes the interim president. And by God, I'm the interim president. So, yeah, Maduro exerting power. <laughs> carrying out power, Guaido saying that he was the president, and then the international game started being played. Because more than 50 countries recognized Guaido. Why? Because one thing, if there's one thing that Latin Americans understand, it's the Constitution and the law. And if you have that on your side, and that's what Maduro always argued beforehand. When people complained against him, he said, I was elected. I'm the elected president. But he overstepped. That combined with the terrible economic situation uh, has caused uh, the problem that we're in right now. And there are loggerheads. They're, they tried to sit down and negotiate on a couple of times, on, on a couple of occasions. Maduro has kept saying, "Let's sit down and talk." And when he says, "Let's sit down and talk," it's always a time buying operation. The opposition does not understand that. Um, but what makes Venezuela different now than just another Latin American country going through a political turmoil, the humanitarian crisis? There are four million refugees since 2016. The number is second only to Syria. Colombia has gotten 1.3 or 1.4. Uh, Peru is up to 800, 900,000. Chile about 300,000. Ecuador about 300,000. The international response has not been enough. Uh, and now Venezuelans are the largest group seeking asylum in the United States. Um, there, are, there are all sorts of ideas out there on how to, what to, what to do with it. Um, one of them recently was saying, oh, stop the sanctions, the sanctions are terrible, and we are participating in them, and we're causing great humanitarian crisis. Was causing great humanitarian crisis is the Maduro government in power. That's what it is. Um, so there's an idea: let's let Venezuela sell its oil, but control the sale of oil to money for humanitarian use. There's only one problem with that. That's a formula that was tried in Iraq. Uh, so much corruption that it's very. No, come on. Let's, let's be real. Um, I could recite you the history of Venezuela beginning in the year 1998, which I witnessed. Uh, and I've talked to you about what happened in uh, 2019. Um, I was asked to provide some analysis in uh, July of this year. And I said the following, the economic and humanitarian trends are continuing downward and are very worrisome. The Maduro regime is steadily weaker, the result of sanctions, international isolation, pressure, the work of the Lima Group and the other Latin Americans. There was a devastating UN human rights report about Venezuela. And who authored it? 
the former socialist president of Chile, who's president of the UN Human Rights Commission. So they can't say, oh, there go the gringo control. You know, no, it doesn't work anymore. But the big question, the big question is, what about the Venezuelan military? And that's something that will come up in the conference, because we have two experts sitting right in the front row on military in Latin America. So far, the Venezuelan military is uh, arms length. This is a political problem. Um, well, the question is, is that going to continue? Uh, the opposition from time to time is, you know, beating itself up. But so far, they're sticking together. Uh, recent things, um, I didn't even get into the uh, Constituent Assembly because that's an attempt to deviate political interest into writing a new constitution, which is not having much success. Uh, let me just review to have some fun. Some of the scenarios going on, some of the things you hear in Washington about what's going on, about what's going to happen. What everybody asks, what's going to happen? Will the United States intervene militarily? Well, would you, Panama, why can't we do it? Just send the Marines, take yeah. care of it. Yeah. yeah? Big country, 30 million people, big geography, difficult terrain. They have a lot of arms. The Russians are playing around with arms. The Cubans are playing around. You think that would be easy? Do you think the American people would like to see our troops on the ground in Venezuela to resolve a problem that the Venezuelans created themselves? Okay. Uh, will the administration just give up and say, oh, the hell with Venezuela? Uh, I don't think so. Just look at everything that's coming out of Washington. Uh, will there be a negotiated transition? Maybe with a role for Cuba. Oh, could be. Or without a role for Cuba. Hmm. Remember, they're Venezuelans. They know each other. And they know how to deal with each other. Will the opposition convince the military to come over on their side, on the side of the Constitution? Or... Maybe the Venezuelan military will simply take over itself and say, you, pull, you, you civilians, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> the question is, can the Venezuelans resolve it themselves? Uh, the dialogues of the past have been Maduro time buying, but new talks cannot be discounted. Our administration doesn't like the idea of the opposition sitting down with with uh, the bad guys. And they are bad guys, by the way. These are people involved in narcotics trafficking <laughs> and worse. <laughs> uh, and they've invited the Cubans to come in. And the Russians are supplying all sorts of aid. What about a national unity government? Huh? And then an internationally observed election. And the opposition said, we tried to convince Maduro on something like that. He said no. Well, it's true. <laughs> so the opposition policy right now is keep up the pressure, international pressure, internal pressure, keep exploring all the options. Okay, let's look at what U.S. options are. I talked about military. That's an option. Washington has said all options are on the table. Theoretically, that's an option. But what's the current policy? It's non-military. Watching carefully, all options are on the table and there is a grinding going on. Unrelenting pressure. Sanctions on individuals, on military people, members of the Supreme Court, but with the offer of selective, offer, selectively, of relief to individuals if they decide to support a democratic transition. So it's a carrot and a stick, okay? But in the meantime, the sanctions are going to keep on increasing. At the same time, there's a lot of active diplomacy going on to support the sanctions, and 
the opposition to depose the regime. The Latins, Latin Americans, and the Europeans should be doing a lot more. There are a lot of holes in the sanction system. And the focus should be on, the administration is saying, elections, freeing political prisoners, and human rights. And, and, but if the Venezuelans want to sit down with each other, Washington is saying to the Democratic opposition, no, 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 you shouldn't sit down with the bad guys. Um, well, uh, but that could be a solution. And that's what we're doing. Something very interesting is what to do with the Venezuelan people coming out of Venezuela who have an irregular visa status. And we have something called TPS, um, Temporary Protective Status that we gave years ago to Central Americans. Should it be given to Venezuelans? The administration said, wait a minute, we don't want to do anything like that. So they, well, what more could the U.S. do than what it's doing right now? Have we painted ourselves into a corner? Good question. Good question. Uh, and there are all sorts of things that could be done, some sort of selective military things. Um, and uh, it gets, we get into the weeds. I don't want to get into the weeds. Uh, and uh, with regard to the use of military force, there are pros and there are cons. Let me review them. The pros. If we do military stuff, gets Maduro out, policy objective achieved, saves up Venezuelan democracy, ends the humanitarian tragedy, and is widely supported, by the way, in South Florida. <laughs> so if you have any political questions in your head, you should. The cons, <laughs> the United States, as Colin Powell used to say, the pottery barn situation. You break the crockery and you pay for it. You own it. If we did that, it would be our problem. Then there's a the question of will it work? Is it supported by the public in the United States? Or President Trump? And the United States would be criticized for going back to old, old war stuff. What should the United States not do? Avoid, avoid bombastic rhetoric, do quiet, smart diplomacy, stay engaged. Sanctions? Yeah, because we can't undo the sanctions now. An oil embargo? That's a really big oil embargo. What's going to happen with Sitco? You know, Sitco, one of the largest petroleum companies in the United States, owned by Venezuela, but it's getting all tied up in the judiciary system. So I've left the Venezuelan stuff on the table with you all to chew on, to think about. You're a World Affairs Council. You think about US government policy. I'm telling you, the people in Washington don't have an easy answer for it. They have tough situations that they're looking at, but they're looking at it. They're looking at it. But what's really interesting is you see largely bipartisan support for what the administration is doing. Uh, nobody seems to be wanting to make an internal political issue of it. Finally, some overall observations regarding US policy in the hemisphere. Uh, our overall policies with bilateral agreement are engagement, supporting democracy, increasing trade, people-to-people -people relationships, cultural relationships, all of that makes sense. It's bipartisan. On the political and security side, see the policies through Central America, Mexico, Colombia. Look at each country by country with regard to security interests and tailor your approach accordingly. Trade, keep it thriving. Get the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement passed. And it's going to be a challenge for the Congress. Um, but it's the right thing to do. Watch the Pacific. 
maybe revitalize, not revitalize, but reinvent the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Be very careful with Brazil and very positive and very forward-leaning and very smart. We have a government that wants to do business with us. Quiet diplomacy, strong military, keep our military strong, uh, because our military in the Western Hemisphere is not around to, in to invade, to intervene, but it's right there when there's disaster relief and everybody knows we can be counted upon. Finally, you need strategic patience when it's necessary, of not doing, not saying. And a final thought, to go back into history and the historians in the audience, I hope would appreciate it, speak softly and carry lots of big sticks. <laughs>